Chapter One of the Uttermost Farthing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne, December 2009. The Uttermost Farthing by R. Austin Freeman. Chapter One The Motive Force. It is not without some misgivings that I at length make public the strange history communicated to me by my lamented friend Humphrey Challoner. The outlook of the narrator is so evidently abnormal, his ethical standards are so remote from those ordinarily current, that the chronicle of his life and actions may not only fail to secure the sympathy of the reader, but may even excite a certain amount of moral repulsion. But by those who knew him, his generosity to the poor, and especially to those who struggled against undeserved misfortune, will be an ample set-off to his severity and even ferocity toward the enemies of society. Humphrey Challoner was a great savant, spoiled by untimely wealth. When I knew him he had lapsed into a mere delante, at least so I thought at the time, though subsequent revelations showed him in a rather different light. He had some reputation as a criminal anthropologist, and had formerly been well known as a comparative anatomist, but when I made his acquaintance he seemed to be occupied chiefly in making endless additions to the specimens in his private museum. This collection I could never quite understand. It consisted chiefly of human and other mammalian skeletons, all of which presented certain small deviations from the normal but its object I could never make out, until after his death, and then, indeed, the revelation was a truly astounding one. I first made Challoner's acquaintance in my professional capacity. He consulted me about some trifling ailment, and we took rather a liking to each other. He was a learned man, and his learning overlapped my own specialty, so that we had a good deal in common, and his personality interested me deeply. He gave me the impression of a man naturally buoyant, genial, witty, whose life had been blighted by some great sorrow. Ordinarily sad and grave in manner, he exhibited flashes of a grim, fantastic humor that came as a delightful surprise, and showed what he had been, and might still have been, but for the tragedy at which he sometimes hinted. Gentle, sympathetic, generous, his universal kindliness had yet one curious exception. His attitude towards habitual offenders against the law was one of almost ferocious vindictiveness. At the time that I went away from my autumn holiday his health was not quite satisfactory. He made no complaint, indeed he expressed himself as feeling perfectly well, but a certain indefinable change in his appearance had made me a little uneasy. I said nothing to him on the subject, merely asking him to keep me informed as to his condition during my absence, but it was not without anxiety that I took leave of him. The habits of London society enable a consultant to take a fairly liberal holiday. I was absent about six weeks, and when I returned and called on Chandler, his appearance shocked me. There was no doubt now as to the gravity of his condition. His head appeared to have almost doubled in size. His face was bloated, his features were thickened, his eyelids puffy and his eyes protruding. He stood, breathing hard from the exertion of crossing the room, and held out an obviously swollen hand. "'Well, Wharton,' said he, with a strange, shapeless smile, "'how do you find me? Don't you think I'm getting a fine fellow? Growing like a pumpkin, by Jove! I've changed the size of my collars three times in a month, and the new ones are too tight already.' He laughed, as he had spoken, in a thick, muffled voice, and I made shift to produce some sort of smile in response to his hideous facial contortion. "'You don't seem to like the novelty, my child,' he continued gaily, and with another horrible grin. "'Don't like this softening of the classic outlines, hey? Well, I'll admit it isn't pretty, but, bless us, what does it matter at my time of life?' I looked at him in consternation as he stood, breathing quickly, with that uncanny smile on his enormous face. It was highly unprofessional of me, no doubt, but there was little use in attempting to conceal my opinion of his case." Something inside his chest was pressing on the great veins of the neck and arms. That something was either an aneurysm or a solid tumor. A brief examination, to which he submitted with cheerful unconcern, showed that it was a solid growth, and I told him so. He knew some pathology and was, of course, an excellent anatomist. 
so there was no avoiding a detailed explanation. "'Now, for my part,' said he, buttoning up his waistcoat, "'I'd sooner have an aneurysm. There's a finality about an aneurysm. It gives you fair notice so that you may settle your affairs, and then, pop, bang, and the affair's over. How long will this thing take?' I began to hum and haw nervously, but he interrupted. "'It doesn't matter to me, you know. I'm only asking from curiosity, and I don't expect you to give a date. But is it a matter of days or weeks? I can see it isn't one of months.' "'I should think, Challoner,' I said huskily, "'it may be four or five weeks at the outside.' "'Ah,' he said brightly, "'that will suit me nicely. I've finished my job and rounded up my affairs generally, so that I am ready whenever it happens.' but light your pipe and come and have a look at the museum. Now, as I knew, or believed I knew, by heart every specimen in the collection, this suggestion struck me as exceedingly odd, but reflecting that his brain might well have suffered some disturbance from the general engorgement, I followed him without remark. Slowly we passed down the corridor that led to the museum wing, walked through the ill-smelling laboratories, for Chandler prepared the bones of the lower animals himself, though— for obvious reasons, he acquired the human skeletons from dealers, and entered the long room where the main collection was kept. Here we halted, and while Challoner recovered his breath, I looked round on the familiar scene. The inevitable whale skeleton, a small sperm whale, hung from the ceiling, on massive iron supports. The side of the room nearest the door was occupied by a long glass case filled with skeletons of animals, all diseased, deformed, or abnormal. On the floor space under the whale stood the skeletons of a camel and an aurochs. The camel was afflicted with rickets, and the aurochs had multiple exostoses, or bony tumors. At one end of the room was a large case of skulls, all deformed or asymmetrical. At the other stood a long table and a chest of shallow drawers, while the remaining long side of the room was filled from end to end by a glass case about eight feet high, containing a number of human skeletons each neatly articulated, and standing on its own pedestal. Now, this long case had always been somewhat of a mystery to me. Its contents differed from the other specimens in two respects. First, whereas all the other skeletons and skulls bore full descriptive labels, these human skeletons were distinguished merely by a number and a date on the pedestal. And second, whereas all the other specimens illustrated some disease or deformity, these were, apparently, quite normal, or showed only some trifling abnormality. They were beautifully prepared and bleached to ivory whiteness, but otherwise they were of no interest, and I could never understand Challoner's object in accumulating such a number of duplicate specimens. "'You think you know this collection inside out,' said Challoner, as if reading my thoughts. "'I know it pretty well, I think,' was my reply. "'You don't know it at all,' he rejoined. "'Oh, come,' I said. "'I could write a catalogue of it from memory.' Challoner laughed. "'My dear fellow,' said he, "'you have never seen the real gems of the collection. "'I am going to show them to you now.' He passed his arm through mine, and we walked slowly up the long room, and as we went, he glanced in at the skeletons in the great case with a faint and very horrible smile on his bloated face. At the extreme end I stopped him, and pointed to the last skeleton in the case. I want you to explain to me, Challoner, why you have distinguished this one by a different pedestal from the others. As I spoke, I ran my eye along the row of gaunt shapes that filled the great case. Each skeleton stood on a pedestal of ebonized wood, on which was a number and date painted in white, excepting the end one, the pedestal of which was coated with scarlet enamel, and the number and date on it were in gold lettering. That specimen, said Challoner thoughtfully, is the last one of the flock. It made the collection complete, so I marked it with the distinctive pedestal. You will understand all about it when you take over. Now come and look at my gems. He walked behind the chest of drawers and stood facing the wall, which was covered with mahogany paneling. Each panel was about four feet wide by five high, was bordered by a row of carved rosettes, and was separated from the adjoining panels by pilasters. Now watch me, Wharton, said he. You see these two rosettes near the bottom of the panel. You press your thumbs on them, so, and you give half a turn. That turns a catch. Then you do this. He grasped the pilaster on each side of the panel, gave a gentle pull, 
and the panel and pilasters came away bodily, exposing a moderate-sized cupboard. I hastily relieved him of the panel, and when he had recovered his breath, he began to expound the contents of this curious hiding-place. "'That row of books you will take possession of and examine when my lease falls in. You are my executor, and this collection will be yours to keep, or give away, or destroy, as you think fit. The books consist of a fingerprint album, a portrait album, a catalogue, and a history of the collection. You will find them all quite interesting. Now I will show you the gems, if you will lift those boxes down on to the table.' I did as he asked, lifting down the pile of shallow boxes and placing them, at his direction, side by side on the table. When they were arranged to his satisfaction, he took off the lids with somewhat of a flourish, and I uttered an exclamation of amazement. The boxes were filled with dolls' heads. At least, such I took them to be. But such dolls! I had never seen anything like them before. So horribly realistic, and yet so unnatural! I can only describe the impression they produced by that much misused word, weird. They were uncanny in the extreme, suggesting to the beholder the severed heads of a company of fantastic, grotesque-looking dwarfs. Let me try to describe them in detail. Each head was about the size of a small monkey's, that is, about four inches long. It appeared to be made of some fine leather or vellum, remarkably like human skin in texture. The hair in all of them was disproportionately long and very thick, so that it looked somewhat like a paintbrush, but it was undoubtedly human hair. The eyebrows, too, were unnaturally thick and long, so were the moustache and beard when present, being composed, as I could plainly see, of genuine moustache and beard hairs of full length, and very closely set. Some were made to represent clean-shaven men, and some even showed two or three days' growth of stubble which stubble was disproportionately long and most unnaturally dense. The eyes of all were closed, and the eyelashes formed a thick, projecting brush. But despite the abnormal treatment of the hairy parts, these little heads had the most astonishingly realistic appearance and were, as I have said, excessively weird and rather dreadful in aspect. And, in spite of the closed eyes and set features, each had an expression and character of its own. Each, in fact, seemed to be a faithful and spirited portrait of a definite individual. They were upwards of twenty in number, all male, and all represented persons of the European type. Each reposed in a little velvet-lined compartment, and each was distinguished by a label bearing a number and a date. I looked up at Challoner, and found him regarding me with an inscrutable and hideous smile. "'These are very extraordinary productions, Challoner,' said I. "'What are they?' And what are they made of? Made of, my dear fellow, said he. Why, the same as you and I are made of, to be sure. Do you mean to say, I exclaimed, that these little heads are made of human skin? Undoubtedly. Human skin and human hair. What else did you think? I looked at him with a puzzled frown and finally said that I did not understand what he meant. Have you never heard of the Mundaruku Indians? he asked. I shook my head. What about them? I asked. You will find an account of them in Bates's Naturalist on the Amazon, and there is a reference to them in Gold and Pyle's Anomalies. There was a pause, during which I gazed, not without awe, at the open boxes. Finally I looked at Challoner and asked, Well? Well, these are examples of the Mundaruchu work. I looked again at the boxes, and I must confess that, as my eye travelled along the rows of impassive faces, and noted the perfect, though diminutive features, the tiny ears, the bristling hair, the frowning eyebrows, so discordant with the placid expression and peacefully closed eyes, a chill of horror crept over me. The whole thing was so unreal, so unnatural, so suggestive of some diabolical wizardry. I looked up sharply at my host. "'Where did you get these things, Challoner?' I asked. His bloated face exhibited again that strange, inscrutable smile. "'You will find a full account of them in the archives of the museum. Every specimen is fully described there, and the history of its acquirement and origin given in detail. They are interesting little objects, aren't they?' "'Very,' I replied abstractedly, 
for I was speculating at the moment on the disagreement between the appearance of the heads and their implied origin. Finally, I pointed out the discrepancy. But these heads were never prepared by those Indians you speak of. Why not? Because they're all Europeans. In fact, most of them look like Englishmen. Well, and what about it? Challoner seemed quietly amused at my perplexity, but at this moment my eye noted a further detail, which, I cannot exactly say why, seemed to send a fresh shiver down my spine. Look here, Challoner, I said. Why is this head distinguished from the others? They are all in compartments lined with black velvet and have black labels with white numbers and dates. This one has a compartment lined with red velvet and a red label with a gold number and date, just as in the case of that end skeleton. I glanced across at the case, and then it came to me in a flash that the numbers and dates were identical on both. Challoner saw that I had observed this, and replied, It is perfectly simple, my dear fellow. That skeleton and this head were acquired on the same day, and with their acquisition my collection was complete. They were the final specimens, and I have added nothing since I got them. But in the case of the head there was a further reason for a distinctive setting. It is the gem of the whole collection. Just look at the hair. Take my lens and examine it. He handed me his lens, and I picked the head out of its scarlet nest. It was as light as a cork, and brought it close to my eye. And then, even without the lens, I could see what Challoner meant. The hair presented an excessively rare abnormality. It was what is known as ringed hair. That is to say, each hair was marked by alternate light and dark rings. "'You say this is really human hair?' I asked. "'Undoubtedly, and a very fine example of ringed hair, the only one, I may say, that I have ever seen.' "'I have never seen a specimen before,' said I, laying the little head down in its compartment. "'Nor,' I added, "'have I ever seen or heard of anything like these uncanny objects. Won't you tell me where you got them?' "'Not now,' said Challoner. "'You will learn all about them from the archives, and very interesting you will find them. And now we'll put them away.' He placed the lids on the boxes, and, when I had stowed them away in the cupboard, he made me replace the panel and take a special note of the position of the fastenings for future use. "'Can you stay and have some dinner with me?' he asked, adding, "'I am quite presentable at table still, though I don't swallow very comfortably.' "'Yes,' I answered. "'I will stay with pleasure.' I am not officially back at work yet. Hanley is still in charge of my practice. Accordingly, we dined together, though, as far as he was concerned, the dinner was rather an empty ceremony. But he was quite cheerful. In fact, he seemed in quite high spirits, and in the intervals of struggling with his food, contrived to talk a little in his quaint, rather grotesquely humorous fashion. While the meal was in progress, however, our conversation was merely desultory, and not very profuse but when the cloth was removed and the wine set on the table, he showed a disposition for more connected talk. "'I suppose I can have a cigar, Wharton. Won't shorten my life seriously, hm?' If it would have killed him on the spot, I should have raised no objection. I replied by pushing the box toward him, and, when he had selected a cigar and cut off its end with a meditative air, he looked up at me and said, "'I am inclined to be reminiscent to-night, Wharton, to treat you to a little autobiography, hm?' "'By all means. You will satisfy your own inclinations and my curiosity at the same time.' "'You're a deuced polite fellow, Wharton, but I'm not going to bore you. You'll be really interested in what I'm going to tell you, and especially will you be interested when you come to go through the museum by the light of the little history that you are going to hear. For you must know that my life for the last twenty years has been bound up with my collection. The one is, as it were, a commentary on and an illustration of the other.' "'Did you know that I had ever been married?' "'No,' I answered in some surprise, for Challoner had always seemed to me the very type of the solitary, self-contained bachelor. "'I have never mentioned it,' said he. "'The subject would have been a painful one. It is not now. The malice of sorrow and misfortune loses its power as I near the end of my pilgrimage. Soon I shall step across the border and be out of its jurisdiction for ever.' He paused, lit his cigar, took a few labored draughts of the fragrant smoke, and resumed. I did not marry until I was turned forty. I had no desire to. I was a solitary man, 
full of my scientific interests, and not at all susceptible to the influence of women. But at last I met my late wife, and found her different from all other women whom I had seen. She was a beautiful girl, some twenty years younger than I, highly intelligent, cultivated, and possessed of considerable property. Of course I was no match for her. I was nothing to look at, was double her age, was only moderately well off, and had no special standing either socially or in the world of science. But she married me, and as I may say, she married me handsomely, by which I mean that she always treated our marriage as a great stroke of good fortune for her, as if the advantages were all on her side instead of on mine. As a result we were absolutely devoted to each other. Our life was all that married life could be, and that it so seldom is. We were inseparable, in our work, in our play, in every interest and occupation, we were in perfect harmony. We grudged the briefest moment of separation, and avoided all society because we were so perfectly happy with each other. She was a wife in a million, and it was only after I had married her that I realized what a delightful thing it is to be alive. My former existence, looked back on from that time, seemed but a blank expanse, through which I had stagnated as a chrysalis lingers on, half alive, through the dreary months of winter. We lived thus in unbroken concord, with mutual love that grew from day to day, until two years of perfect happiness had passed. And then the end came. Here Challoner paused, and a look of unutterable sadness settled on his poor, misshapen face. I watched him with an uncomfortable premonition of something disagreeable in the sequel of his narrative, as, with his trembling, puffy hand, he relighted the cigar that had gone out in the interval. The end came he repeated presently. The perfect happiness of two human beings was shattered in a moment. Let me describe the circumstances. I am usually a light sleeper, like most men of an active mind, but on this occasion I must have slept more heavily than usual. I awoke, however, with somewhat of a start, and the feeling that something had happened. I immediately missed my wife and sat up in bed to listen. Faint creakings and sounds of movement were audible from below, and I was about to get up and investigate when a door slammed. A bell rang loudly, and then the report of a pistol, or gun, echoed through the house. I sprang out of bed and rushed down the stairs. As I reached the hall, someone ran past me in the darkness. There was a blinding flash close to my face and a deafening explosion, and when I recovered my sight, the form of a man appeared for an instant dimly silhouetted in the opening of the street door. The door closed with a bang, leaving the house wrapped in silence and gloom. My first impulse was to pursue the man, but it immediately gave way to alarm for my wife. I groped my way into the dining-room and was creeping towards the place where the matches were kept, when my bare foot touched something soft and bulky. I stooped to examine it, and my outspread hand came in contact with a face. I sprang up with a gasp of terror and searched frantically for the matches. In a few moments I had found them, and tremblingly struck a light, and the first glimmer of the flame turned my deadly fear to yet more deadly realization. My wife lay on the hearth-rug, her upturned face as white as marble, her half-opened eyes already glazing. A great brown scorch marked the breast of her nightdress, and at its center was a small stain of blood. She was stone dead, I saw that at a glance. The bullet must have passed right through her heart, and she must have died in an instant. That, too, I saw, and though I called her by her name and whispered words of tenderness into her ears, though I felt her pulseless wrists and chafed her hands, so waxen now and chill, I knew that she was gone. I was still kneeling beside her, crazed, demented by grief and horror, still stroking her poor white hand, telling her that she was my dear one, my little Kate, and begging her, foolishly, to come back to me, to be my little friend and playmate of old, still, I say, babbling in the insanity of grief, when I heard a soft step descending the stair. It came nearer. The door opened and someone stole into the room on tiptoe. It was the housemaid, Harriet. She stood stock still when she saw us, and stared and uttered strange whimpering cries like a frightened dog and then suddenly she turned and stole away silently as she had come, and I heard her running softly upstairs. 
Presently she came down again, but this time she passed the dining room and went out of the street door. I vaguely supposed that she had gone for assistance, but the matter did not concern me. My wife was dead. Nothing mattered now. Harriet did not return, however, and I soon forgot her. The death of my dear one grew more real. I began to appreciate it as an actual fact, and with this realization the question of my own death arose. I took it for granted from the first. The burden of solitary existence was not to be entertained for a moment. The only question was how, and I debated this in leisurely fashion, sitting on the floor with Kate's hand in mine. I had a pistol upstairs, and, of course, there were keen-edged scalpels in the laboratory. But, strange as it may appear, the bias of an anatomical training even then opposed the idea of gross mechanical injuries. However, there were plenty of poisons available and to this method I inclined as more decent and dignified. Having settled on the method, I was disposed to put it into practice at once, but then another consideration arose. My wife would have to be buried. By some hands she must be laid in her last resting place, and those hands could be none other than my own, so I must stay behind for a little while. The hours passed on unreckoned until pencils of cold blue daylight began to stream in through the chinks of the shutters and contend with the warm gaslight within. Then another footstep was heard on the stairs, and the cook, Wilson, came into the room. She, like the housemaid, stopped dead when she saw my wife's corpse, and stood for an instant staring wildly with her mouth wide open, but only for an instant. The next she was flying out the front door, rousing the street with her screams. The advent of the cook roused me. I knew that the police would arrive soon, and I instinctively looked about me to see how this unspeakable thing had happened. I had already noticed that one of my wife's hands, the one I had been holding, was clenched, and I now observed that it grasped a little tuft of hair. I drew out a portion of the tuft and looked at it. It was coarse hair, about three inches long, and a dull gray in color. I laid it on the clean notepaper in the drawer of the bureau bookcase to examine later and then glanced around the room. The origin of the tragedy was obvious. The household plate had been taken out of the plate chest in the pantry and laid out on the end of the dining table. There the things stood, their polished surfaces sullied by the greasy finger marks of the wretch who had murdered my wife. At those tell-tale marks I looked with new and growing interest. Fingerprints in those days had not yet been recognized by the public or the police as an effective means of identification but they were well known to scientific men, and I had given the subject some attention myself. At the sight of those signs, manual of iniquity had an immediate effect on me. They converted the unknown perpetrator of this horror from a mere abstraction of disaster into a real living person. With a sudden flash of hate and loathing, I realized that this wretch was even now walking the streets or lurking in his accursed den, and I realized, too, that these marks were, perhaps, the only links that connected him with the foul deed that he had done. I looked over the plate quickly, and selected a salver and a large, globular teapot, on both of which the prints were very distinct. These I placed in a drawer of the bureau, and, turning the key, dropped it into the pocket of my pajamas, and at that moment the bell rang violently. I went to the door and admitted a police constable and the cook. The latter looked at me with evident fear and horror, and the constable said, somewhat sternly, "'This young woman tells me there's something wrong here, sir.' I led him into the dining-room. The cook remained at the door, peering in with an ashen face, and showed him my wife's corpse. He took off his helmet and asked rather gruffly how it happened. I gave him a brief account of the catastrophe, on which he made no comment except to remark that the inspector would be here presently. The inspector actually arrived within a couple of minutes, accompanied by a sergeant, and the two officers questioned me closely. I repeated my statement and saw at once that they did not believe me. They suspected me of having committed the murder myself. I noted the fact with dull surprise, but without annoyance. It didn't seem to matter to me what they thought. They called the cook in and questioned her, but of course she knew nothing. Then they sent her to find the housemaid but the housemaid had disappeared, and her outdoor clothes and a large handbag had disappeared too, which put a new complexion on the matter. Then the officers examined the plate and looked at the finger marks on it. The constable discovered the tuft of hair in my poor wife's hand, and the inspector, having noted its color, and looked rather hard at my hair, 
put it for safety in a blue envelope which he pocketed, and I suspect it never saw the light again. At this time the police surgeon arrived, but there was nothing for him to do but note the state of the body as bearing on the time at which death took place. The police took possession of some of the plate, with a dim idea of comparing the fingerprints with the fingers of the murderer if they should catch him. But they never did catch him. Not a single vestige of a clue to his identity was ever forthcoming. The housemaid was searched for, but never found. The coroner's jury returned a verdict of will for murder against some person unknown. And that was the end of the matter. I accompanied my dearest to the place where she was laid to rest, where soon I shall join her, and I came back alone to the empty house. It is unnecessary for me to say that I did not kill myself. In the interval I had seen things in a new light. It was evident to me from the first that the police would never capture that villain, and yet he had to be captured. He had incurred a debt, and that debt had to be paid. Therefore I remained behind to collect it. That was twenty years ago, Wharton. Twenty long, gray, solitary years. Many a time have I longed to go to her, but the debt remained unpaid. I have tried to make the time pass by getting my little collection together and studying the very instructive specimens in it, and it has lightened the burden. But all the time I have been working to collect that debt and earn my release. He paused a while, and I ventured to ask, And is the debt paid? At last it is paid. The man was caught, then, in the end? Yes, he was caught. And I hope, I exclaimed fervently, that the scoundrel met with his deserts, I mean, that he was duly executed. Yes, Challoner answered quietly, he was executed. How did the police discover him, after all? I asked. You will find, said Challoner, a full account of the affair in the last volume of the museum archives. Then, noting the astonishment on my face at this amazing statement, he added, You see, Wharton, the museum archives are, in a sense, a personal diary. My life has been wrapped up in the museum, and I have associated all the actions of my life with the collection. I think you will understand when you read it. And now let us dismiss these recollections of a ruined life. I have told you my story. I wanted you to hear it from my own lips, and you have heard it. Now let us take up a glass of wine, and talk of something else. I looked at my watch, and, finding it much later than I had supposed, rose to take my leave. I oughtn't to have kept you up like this, I said. You ought to have been in bed an hour ago. Challoner laughed his queer, muffled laugh. Bed, exclaimed he. I don't go to bed nowadays. Haven't been able to lie down for the last fortnight. Of course he hadn't. I might have known that. Well, I said, at any rate, let me make you comfortable for the night before I go. How do you generally manage? I ring up a headrest on the edge of the table, pull up the armchair, wrap myself in a rug, and sleep leaning forward. I'll show you. Just get down Owen's comparative anatomy, and stack the volumes close to the edge of the table. Then set up Parker's monograph on the shoulder girdle, in a slanting position against them. Fine book, that of Parker's. I enjoyed it immensely when it first came out, and it makes a splendid headrest. I'll go and get into my pajamas while you are arranging things. He went off to his adjacent bedroom, and I piled up the ponderous volumes on the table, and drew up the armchair. When he returned, I wrapped him in a couple of thick rugs and settled him in his chair. He laid his arms on the massive monograph, rested his forehead on them, and murmured cheerfully that he should now be quite comfortable until the morning. I wished him good night, and walked slowly to the door and as I held it open I stopped to look back at him. He raised his head and gave me a farewell smile, a queer, ugly smile, but full of courage and a noble patience. And so I left him. Thereafter I called to see him every day and settled him to rest every night. His disease made more rapid progress even than I had expected, but he was always bright and cheerful, never made any complaint, and never again referred to his troubled past. One afternoon I called, a little later than usual, and when the housemaid opened the door I asked her how he was. "'He isn't any better, sir,' she answered. "'He's getting most awful fat, sir, about the head, I mean.' "'Where is he now?' I asked. "'He's in the dining-room, sir. I think he's gone to sleep.' I entered the room quietly and found him resting by the table. He was wrapped up in his rugs and his head rested on his beloved monograph. I walked up to him and spoke his name softly but he did not rouse. 
I leaned over him and listened, but no sound or movement of breathing was perceptible. The housemaid was right. He had gone to sleep, or, in his own phrase, had passed out of the domain of sorrow. End of chapter 1